He said, in China, they'll be lucky if the robots come just in time. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he walked me through the demographics of modern China. He walked me through the fact that their workforce is aging even more quickly than America's. You know, and I really dived into demography and it really reframed the way I looked at the world. The thing I worry about most is will we use these things to dumb down the human species or will we use this technology to make the human species more intelligent? I can see it going down both paths. And I, once again, I think it's a very human decision. What I will be curious to see if the machines can do a good job of interviewing somebody. So what I'd love to do is just kick off with, could you just take a minute to introduce yourself and tell us like, how the hell did you get into tech journalism in the first place and now in the position you're at today? Sure. It helped that I grew up in, in what would become Silicon Valley. I went to school in high school in Palo Alto, and then I went away for 10 years and I returned here in 1977. Silicon Valley it, it had happened while I was away. And I've been very curious about why Silicon Valley happened when it did and where it did. And that's a, a question I've thought about a lot. And I came back here because I was very interested in microelectronics and the technologies that were emerging that would become personal computing and the internet. And at a certain point, actually, I stumbled across a book writ written by a British journalist, Christopher Evans. The book was called The Micro Millennium. And then he was making an argument about the impact the microprocessor was going to have on the world. And I thought, well, that's a nice beat. Why don't I focus on that? And it turned out he was right. It did change the world. And that was 77. And I began as a freelancer and worked for some technical publications and ultimately spent most of my career at the New York Times writing about the impact of technology. Leading off of that, John, you were part right, of the 2013 New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning team for explanatory reporting. And at that time, covering business practices of the big tech giants like Apple and, and others. And I believe it, it actually used the word like illustrating the darker side of changing of the changing economy for workers and consumers. Since then, like, how has your perspective evolved on that? Yeah, it, my, my perspective has changed. The part that I took in that, most of that, most of that series was focused on Apple's shift to a Chinese labor force to build their computers. And I was looking a little bit forward. I was interested in how quickly manufacturing would be automated and what kind of impact robotics would have on the way we make things. And I ended up not in China. I ended up in the Netherlands reporting on a completely lights out Philips factory, which was really quite remarkable because they were making things that were as complex as iPhones. They were making shavers in a very lights out fashion. So during the process of that reporting, actually, my view of the world changed really dramatically. What I was a complete believer in the, the idea that automation was going to come to China and it was going to lead to a massive dislocation of the workforce and perhaps mm. revolution because people were out of jobs. And I was making that case to a man by the name of Danny Kahneman, a Nobel Prize winning economist. And he stopped and he said, you've got it all wrong. He said, in China, they'll be lucky if the robots come just in time. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he walked me through the demographics of modern China. He walked me through the fact that their workforce is aging even more quickly than America's workforce is waging. And the workforce is aging in America too. And I really dived into demography and it really reframed the way I looked at the world. But before I had that conversation, the favorite question that I would ask engineers in Silicon Valley is when will we have self-driving cars? And after I had that conversation, I changed the question I asked. And the question I asked from then on for the next three or four years that I was reporting on this is when will there be a robot that can safely give an aging human a shower? A harder problem. No one had a good answer. And so what I understood about China from Kahneman's conversation is China actually was short on workers. They didn't have enough workers because of the one-child policy. And they also had a rapidly aging population, so they had a care problem. And there weren't robots to care for aging humans. And it really reframed the way I looked first to China and most of the developing world. The aging of the human population is true everywhere but in Africa and the Middle East. It's true in Europe. It's true in, even in Latin America and particularly in Asia and the United States. We are a graying world and we need robotics and the robots aren't here yet. And so that's a very different take on the sort of, oh my God, the robots are coming kind of view of the world. The robots aren't coming quickly enough. My favorite story 
that I tease my friends with all the time is Roomba. I like to tease my robot building friends by saying, okay, there's one home robot. It's been 25 years. There's been one home robot. What's the next mass uh, consumer robot that's going to be bought for the home? And they don't really have a good answer because most of the problems are hard. And the robots, there's been lots of progress in robotics, but not enough to build a second product for a mass consumer audience. If you don't consider Siri a home robot, there are some people who make the argument right. that Siri all of so it's an interesting time. Lots of progress, and yet the impact of automation has been less dramatic than many in Silicon believed it would be. Isn't it Robert Solo who said, I see automation everywhere, but in the productivity to statistics, productivity is historically low, which has been this incredible puzzle for the economists. So it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful subject. And I've tended to be skeptical. Elon Musk told us we were going to have cars that would drive across the country in what, 2016? And here we right. are seven years later and Teslas are still killing people. That's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. So on that same note, you in 2015, you wrote Machines of Love and Grace. Right, really highlighting that symbiotic relationship between humans and the machines. And even just going back to what you're saying about the robots, there was probably in these early days much more mechanics than any sort of like intelligence or artificial intelligence pro programmed into these things. It was through your work that it really drove the point home for me, the difference between AI, artificial intelligence, and IA, intelligence augmentation. Could you just for a moment define that yeah. for our audience? I came to that, the subject of machines loving grace, or the way I framed the problem from an earlier book called What the Dormouse Said. And I, I was looking at the emergence of the personal computer industry around Stanford in this period between 65 and 75. And I noticed that there were two laboratories that began in the exact same year, 1962, on either side of the Stanford campus. One was started by John McCarthy. He's the person who coined the term artificial intelligence. And he got DARPA money in 62 through 64 to basically build a thinking machine. He set out to replace humans with machines. That was the intent of the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. And I realized it was that same year on the other side of campus, just a couple miles away at SRI, the Stanford Research Institute at that point, Doug Engelbart, who was a computer scientist, coined the term intelligence augmentation. And Engelbart had a very different view of the world than McCarthy. He thought that computers could be used to extend human intelligence. And so you had this dichotomy. On one side, you had AI. On the other side of the campus, you had IA. And that created this tension right at the dawn of interactive computing, which the interactive computing era began in the early 60s. I realized that tension has been at the heart of our discussion of all kinds of impacts that automation has had on the world and AI. And that we, the argument of this book I wrote, Machines of Love and Grace, is was it was a human decision of whether we design humans into the equation or whether we design humans right. out. And I felt it was going to be the engineers that made those decisions. And it's an interesting, it, the shareholders make the decisions, the CEOs make the decisions, the designers, the consumers. And it's still, I see it playing out in all of the these systems that we're starting to use in interesting ways. Absolutely. So on that point, I guess those assumptions you had going into Machines of Love and Grace and now your perspectives since then, have, did you have any complete mental model shifts for yourself? I go back and forth on, on how hopeful I am about this. I see remarkable tools emerging. The, the latest, of course, are the chatbots, this wave of, of yeah, chat language GPT. Model. It, chat GPT or perplexity or you. There are actually lots of them around. It, and yeah. it, they're going to be commodities. We're focused on chat GPT, but in you know, Bard at Google, Apple will have a smarter Siri. It, it, obviously, this is on the horizon. And the thing I worry about most is will we use these things to dumb down the human species or will we use this technology to make the human species more intelligent? I can see it going down both paths. And I, once again, I think it's a very human decision. And I'm a little disheartened by the last couple of months in Silicon Valley because, you know, I was involved at the very beginning in circa 2011, 2012, a very intense discussion began in Silicon Valley about the ethics surrounding artificial intelligence because people realized that this was a powerful technology and it's going to change 
the nature of humanity. And that debate went on for about a decade. And then somebody put about five bucks on the table and everybody <laughs> lunged for the money and forgot about the ethics completely. I think with this, mm. what this last couple of months has shown with Google racing to match Microsoft, racing to invest in open AI, yeah. which was a company with, which began with the premise that it was going to create AI for human good. I'm not quite sure that, and then they be changed into a profit-making company, and then they sold their technology to Microsoft. They saw that there was a lot of money here, just the way there was money with search, and we recapitulated what happened so many times in Silicon Valley. So that's been a disappointment to me. That debate got pushed. Although it's remarkable how much the debate is front and center right now, but clearly the companies are moving quickly to deploy this technology without Absolutely. really thinking about the yeah. Oh, absolutely. So on the, in that same vein, thinking specifically about in the work context and all we're seeing like right now in the heat of this, are we having a recession? Are we not? Layoffs happening across all sectors, especially tech. So if I were to say, if I make this statement, right, the employee-employer relationship is broken. How do you respond to that comment? And what do you attribute to your beliefs? So in thinking about the workplace today, once again, technology is just one component of a whole set of things that are going on right now, and it's so hard to pick them apart. This is going in the on in the context of the lockdown and remote work that caused things to happen that we it's expected would happen for decades and decades. They didn't happen until all of a sudden they happened. And I worked in downtown San Francisco for more than two decades and San, downtown San Francisco is a ghost town now. It's actually, it makes me sad because it was a thriving part of Silicon Valley for decades. And I don't know if it's ever going to come back together. We're in this inter intermediate period. We're talking on Zoom now, and everybody's realized that Zoom works really well. And yeah. yet Zoom has intense limits. Sure. People talk about Zoom fatigue. It's not the... I've been surprised, actually, that this technology, which, which came just in time and provided this wonderful sort of panacea during this time that was needed... It hasn't evolved very quickly. I thought it would evolve more quickly. I thought this might be a forcing function for augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. And that stuff takes a lot of computing, I think. And so maybe maybe at some point it will happen, but it seems like that's been a disappointment so far. Facebook has invested billions of dollars. Apple is on the cusp of doing something. Google has failed a number of times already. I would have thought that that technology would actually transform things more than Zoom. The office, people are starting to talk about what's missing from the workplace today now that we're all remote. And that will be a forcing function to bring people back together. I think people are missing human contact. And as soon as mm -hmm. they can actually get back in contact, there will be some kind of a hybrid form of office. I mean, a friend of mine just went to visit the New York Times in New York City, the place where I used to, I, I worked there for four years and I used to go there regularly. And he said he saw maybe three or four people. The New York Times editorial meeting that happens every day that shapes the newspaper happens by Zoom now. The building felt like a ghost town while he was there. And it used yeah. to be this thriving hub. That was the best part of being a journalist was to be in a newsroom, which was an exciting, vibrant place. And one of the things I even noticed when I was still working, so this is, I retired from the New York Times in 2017, and I was the last of an old generation of reporters. Newsrooms got quiet while people were still together. People weren't talking on the phone. People sent email. They sent texts. It was this strange kind of spooky environment even then. And then, of course, it hollowed out when everybody moved remote. And I imagine there'll be some kind of rebalancing, but that's just a guess on my part. So there's there, there are technology questions. The technology has moved just fast enough, but not as quickly as it might. I think that ChatGPT and chatbots like that will be used in ways that we can't even conceive of yet. People Absolutely. are obsessing about chatbots as writing tools. And that's not what I, as a reporter, I think, okay, okay, that's fine. But I actually am more interested in whether or not chatbots will be able to do a good job of asking questions. That's the part of my job that's, that I, that's the very human part of it. Of writing, as a journalist, reporting was always very template-based. Who, what, where, when, mm -hmm. what, how, and virtually. That was a very structured form of writing. I'm not surprised at all that machines can do that. What I will be curious to see if a machine can do a good job of interviewing somebody. And sure. it's an open question. And that would be a more significant change, I think. Definitely would be. That's a really silly point. You made the comment about how machines could potentially dumb down. And then you also made the comment about just 
we were promised the self-driving car. It's not here yet. There's so much technology like this, the future work investment category, and to me, a little bit laughable. It's like Zoom and like all these other players trying to adjust for today. It's not the future, it's now. Um, I've always been fascinated by this fact that I don't think it's the Silicon Valley that you reported that gave us like Google and the likes of these huge influencers from what I view as like from a leadership standpoint that were like, oh my God, these are enlightened companies. They care about their employees. They're creating great cultures there. It dawned on me through all the work that I've done. They weren't doing that because they're more enlightened than other businesses. They're doing that because they actually manufacture nothing. They manufacture intangibles. The only way to drive productivity is to create that sense of autonomy and empowerment. What do you make of that? And in that, in your comment about machines could potentially be used to dumb down, what are humans left to do? And what's the job for humans and in human management? I've been to this rodeo before, and so I'm yeah. very skeptical. I think I can still say it's true. I haven't looked recently, but as recently as three or four years ago, if you looked at the census categories, no work categories had gone away. Work has changed dramatically, but it's changed less than it might have over a half a century. I think the one category that had gone away the last time I looked was elevator operator. Okay, elevator operators are gone. Lumpers are mostly gone. A lumper is a job that should go away. Those are the guys who pick things up and put things in trucks. If that job went away, I do not think the world would be a worse place. But now you're asking about jobs that we have previously thought of as creative jobs. And so yes. the assumption was that that creative jobs were some somehow secure. And then you rethink these things and you realize that a lot of the things that we think about as creativity, perhaps we're not as creative as we assumed they were, perhaps easier for machines to do things. So it becomes a question of how we design these jobs in the future. And that's a very human decision. The way I used to think about it was, at least this is four or five years ago, I thought about it. The classic example is what do we do with the call center operator? Because there's clearly two paths there. I think you could make the case that one of the ways, one of the most dramatic ways the economy grew in the wake of World War II was in jobs that involved people who answered the telephone to either provide support, service, or to sell things. And to me, that was an, now you can say that's completely in the crosshairs of this wave of automation. Do you create fewer and smarter human call center employees? You could do that with the technology. You could surround them with, with references and smart machines, and or do you just replace them? And it seems like that decision won't be made by the engineers. A company like Microsoft might have really good intent, and their engineers might want to do that. And yet, the call centers are looking at business margins and profitability, and then they say, this business might be more profitable if we dealt without the humans and we didn't have to go to the Philippines right. or India or wherever. And so I'm watching that very carefully to see what happens to that. I think that's a canary in the coal mine kind of profession of work, perhaps now with this wave of technology at real risk. And how do we redesign it? And it's a wonderfully open question. Of course, medicine, you could conceive of systems that would do triage, intake and pass people to either to automated systems or to doctors as needed. You could see improving medical care, redesigning it with this technology. And that's an open question too. That's been slow. I would uh, telehealth has become a big thing. Who goes to the doctor anymore? We zoom with our doctors, right? Um, almost exclusively. And I don't think that's going to change. It's just too convenient and and too much of an example of efficiency. I think this wave of technology has raised those questions, and they will be answered over the next half decade. And I don't have I don't have I haven't been on the ground doing reporting to to give sure. you answers to how that plays out. When you think about the future of work, the, the next generation of workers, what do you think that looks like? I increasingly have seen a change in the workplace. I mean, you know, I was probably the last generation of journalists who came to work for a, a single company for a career. Mm. That seems like impossibly old thing to me these days. And mm. a culture as strong as the New York Times, people pass through the Times now on their way to someplace else. And that that would have been unthinkable to my generation. So that's really gone. What about moving from being an employee to being an independent contractor? And of course, there are lots of reasons that corporations want to increase the number of independent contractors to exude all kinds of flexibility. So I think there are lots of profit pressures to move in that direction. And I think the technology facilitates that. So I assume that, well, it's interesting because at the same time, 
We've had, for the first time in America in a decade or two, we've had more union activity. And so there's cross-cutting cross -cutting forces at work. And I just don't have the on-the-ground kind of reporting chops to tell you how I feel like it's going to play out. I think the technology has moved things to the point where these questions are on the table. And I had a, I guess, a disheartening conversation in 2006 with an AI pioneer by the name of Terry Winograd. Terry was, he was a second generation AI researcher. And he's a very thoughtful person about the social impact of technology. And we were discussing a lot of these questions. And his simple answer was, you have these very high-minded ideals for technology and Maybe that's not possible in the capitalist system. Decisions are made by shareholders, for shareholders. And profit, even after a decade of discussion about AI ethics, in the end, companies like Apple and Microsoft and Google are profit-making corporations, and they're going to optimize for profitability. That we can. It's such an interesting time in Silicon Valley right now. Mm -hmm. so I think there have been 200,000 tech layoffs or more over the next mm -hmm. last five or six months, a huge amount of layoffs. So I've been around the Valley and watched the boom and bust cycle since the late 1960s is when I remember the first recession in Silicon Valley. Unemployment in Santa Clara County is 2% right now. So how is it that you've got these these contradictory things. Is there a lag effect? There may be a lag effect. I'm seeing rental housing show up in Palo Alto in ways that didn't happen. Housing prices are starting to climb. So maybe there's a lag. But right now, it doesn't feel like this is a downturn in Silicon Valley against this background of layoffs. Definitely want to be conscious of your time, John. To wrap us up, you've covered so much, right? From early computing, then the internet, and then into AI, automation. Now we're going to a world of Web3. I believe it's fair to say most companies these days are tech companies. Because if funny to say the tech companies, which are all the blue chip stocks, right? Every company is a tech company these days. So when you think about that, like, what do you look at if you were to think way out, like major trends that you're, you're following that the audience may enjoy to hear? Oh, uh, two minds. Um, a couple of thoughts. I'm one of the people who coined the term web three. Actually, we, we referred to it initially as web 3.0. This was in 2006. And I was referring then to the semantic web, not the crypto web. Somehow the crypto <laughs> community took that term and repurposed it. I'm not uh, really that upset about it. But I am, I also wrote the first article about the blockchain. I wrote it, it wasn't called the blockchain, but the guys who did that first work did it in the 1990s. And they were simply trying to find a way to, to prove the existence of an invention in the world move from a paper laboratory book to a digital laboratory book. And, and the blockchain then took on a life of its own when it was included in the architecture of a cryptocurrency. I still believe that they have not proven the value of a distributed web. I still have not seen anything aside from cryptocurrencies, which I'm extremely skeptical about to come out of the blockchain economy. So the Web3 argument, I guess I have a fundamental disagreement with the goals of the Web3 community, which is to create this trustless world. I think actually, if you take away trust, you take away one of the best human values. Why would you want to destroy trust? Absolutely. Small face-to-face -face interactions are the best things of society. And But that's another, I'm, I, I'm, I'm off on a tangent. Um, so let's look at the current generation of, of chatbots right now. I think what most people have forgotten is that this technology goes back probably most clearly, it goes farther back, but it was probably articulated best by Apple Computer in 1987 in a vision video that I would commend that everybody watch called Knowledge Navigator. Knowledge Navigator was put together by John Scully, some people working for John Scully when he needed to articulate a vision for Apple in the after Steve Jobs had left the company for the first time. And it's interesting to me because I got to know the two designers of Siri quite well, Adam Tyre and Tom Gruber. And this is completely a case where life imitated art. Both Tom Gruber and Adam Chire set out to build Siri because they wanted to create Knowledge Navigator. So the vision video came before the actual architecture. And we're still trying to design a system where we have an intelligent assistant that understands us. And we're not there yet. People want to know where we want to go to look at Knowledge Navigator, because that vision is still a singular vision that is relevant. And I think actually, um, for good or ill, I still, my favorite science fiction movie, above all science fiction movies, a movie called Her, which involved a programmer who fell in love with an intelligent AI. And I think we're still on that path. 
toward that kind of a relationship with machines. I'm particularly interested in whether we can design these systems to do elder care, because there's a lot of evidence that when you keep a human being engaged and don't, the way Americans deal with aging is we just park old people in front of television and that leads to dementia. I wonder whether you can build this technology in a way that you can weave people together in powerful ways that will give their life meaning. And that's a design question. And I think that the tools are there now to, to start designing those systems. It will be wonderful to see that you, they're used in a positive way. That's brilliant. Thank you. Just a qu- quick note on your Web3. Totally agree with you. One of the things that I've been fascinated by is just this concept of digitization of contracts, but portability of data. So now if you have an individual, and you, as you mentioned, you go instead of a crew at one place, you have a career at many places. And so it actually opens the door up to true performance measurement and portability and your ability to say, this is my validated business card or my business performance. And there, then you can create a market around it. You can say, I am worth this much. Yeah. But what, yeah. what do you make of that? Crazy or? Yes, I think that's probably inevitable. I don't think it requires a blockchain to do it. I don't think it requires a distributed web. I think you can do that just fine with a centralized database. And there might be a lot of, first of all, the economics are all still on the side of the centralized database. Uh, If you want to do this in an affordable way, you're good. So I think that's a separate question from the Web3 question. But sure, the taking your digital self with you is already, I see it everywhere now. And clearly it's going to move. Smart contracts seem like they're inevitable. Although we have to make them secure. My favorite website at the moment is a website run by a crypto journalist called web 3 O is going just great.com, which is a simply a running account of the scams and frauds in the supposedly secure crypto world. So there's something wrong. And then she has a ticker where she uh, there's a summation of the amount of money that's been stolen from supposedly secure crypto wallets. It's an interesting <laughs> early days, wild west for sure. <laughs> yeah, very much. John Markoff, thank you. P- pleasure to speak to you today. Is there anything I didn't ask that you'd like to talk about? No, it'd be fun to see your film. Good to meet you. Likewise. I hope we can talk some more. Yeah. I hope so, John. This was an absolute pleasure for me and I look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you.